All right, so let's start with um, what I consider to be the un unspoken rule of writing dialogue. Um, and that is that the, me the needs of the medium in which the story is told dictates the quantity and the style of the dialogue. So of course, obviously, you need to know which medium is most appropriate for the story that you're trying to tell. Um, whether it be prose, fiction or nonfiction, stage, film, television or new media, video games, graphic novels and comics. Um, and the reason why that's important is because some of these require more dialogue than others. Um, if you are writing prose, uh, you can get into the character's heads, um, so you don't tend to need to rely on dialogue as much, versus something like uh, writing for stage where it's ex almost exclusively dialogue driven. Uh, film is a visual medium, so dialogue is, again, not as terribly important there, so you're going to tend to have less dialogue. As a matter of fact, in film, if you have too much dialogue, it tends to slow down the film a little bit. Television seems to be a hybrid because if you think about how we consume television, we often do it at home while we're doing other things. Uh, so you will you know, glance up at the TV, but you can glance down and still listen to what's going on as you're you know, doing whatever else it is that you're doing, folding clothes, whatever. So that tends to be a little bit more of a hybrid. Okay, so what does dialogue do? It reveals character, it carries conflict, it expresses the themes and the premise, and it can foreshadow events. Okay, so this is important. Um, when you're writing dialogue, it's important to consider three aspects of your characters. The physiological aspects, the psychological aspects, and the sociological aspects. And I'm going to itemize these in greater detail, so if, you, if, if you're taking notes and you want to kind of separate the three, so you can take sub-notes or additional notes, you might want to do that. I adapted this from Lejos Egri's The Art of Dramatic Writing. Um, which is a book that's specifically about playwriting, but it really does apply to everything, if you really think about it. It was written in the 40s, so a lot of the references tend to be from plays that are a little bit older. So the physiological, the psychological, and the sociological aspects. And this is important because if you think about it, when we talk normally, everything that we say on a daily basis, everything that comes of, out of our mouths, is a reflection of our entire lived histories. Right? So if I'm you know, at the store and I'm talking to the cashier, whatever I say is a reflection of everything that has come before that moment. Okay? Everything informed that, all aspects of who I am. So it's important to know whether or not you're going to use any of this in your descriptions of your characters. It's still important to know where this character is coming from. Now, I'm personally not a big character bio kind of writer. I don't, I've tried so many times to sit down and write like, lengthy character biographies. I just can't do that. But what I can do, and what I often do as a writer, is I will bullet point traits of that character. And I'll put them on index cards and I'll put them up over my desk. Okay, so this is how I do that. These are the physiological aspects of the character. The sex of your character, the age, the height and weight, the hair, the eyes, and the skin, a posture, the appearance, the defects, and anything that is earned from heredity. So again, I may not use this stuff when I'm describing the characters, but it certainly does inform the way that I you know, articulate what my character is going to say. All right, so the psychological aspects of the character. The sex life, the moral standards of the character, personal premise and ambition, frustrations and disappointments, temperament, the character's attitude toward life, complexes, and that's psychological complexes, narcissistic personality disorder, Napoleon complex, extro whether they're an extrovert, introvert, or ambivert, their abilities, their character qualities, and their IQ. All right, so then we have these sociological character profiles, their social class, what they do for a living, their occupation, their education level, home life, their religion, their race and nationality, the place in the community, their political affiliation, and what they do for amusements and hobbies. Right, so it's important to recognize that, as I said, everything that you say, everything that your character says, is a reflection of everything that they have lived. I approach writing dialogue from, I, I also do a lot of acting, so I approach the writing dialogue from an actor's point of view because a lot of that feels instinctual, and acting is all about action. And you should always look at dialogue as not a way to convey information, because that, even though that's what it can help do story-wise, dialogue is action. 
It is a reflection of action. Okay, so one of the things I like to do, and this is not something I do on a first draft, this is something I do in a revision, is I look at the lines of dialogue that I've written. Every single line of dialogue, whether it's in a novel or a play or a screenplay, I look at that, all of the lines of dialogue and I determine a transitive action verb that can express the character's external goal with saying that line. And it could simply be something to, like to undermine another character or to attack another character or something like that. I think of an, an action verb that best expresses what the character's objective or goal is in saying that line. Okay, so let's say um, I have the line, um, uh, I know what you did last night, right? So the external goal with that line for me, for, for, the, for the character, is to, um, is to maybe attack or maybe to um, um, undermine or accuse. So there's a goal, there's a tactic with that line of dialogue. If an actor were to take that line up, lift that line up out of the novel, they could do something with that line, and it would make it a riveting scene. Now, if my character is just using the dialogue to explain things, and that's my action verb, that's a little boring. Okay? That doesn't necessarily reflect an active objective. So I would change that. I would change the lines of the dialogue in that way. That were, would be where I'd revise to put some stuff under it. Okay? But it's important to understand what the external goal of the line is. What are they trying to do with that line? On that, another unspoken rule. I have not seen this rule anywhere in any book anywhere. If there is, I haven't seen it. But, so it's something that I came up with, which is that a character must be compelled to speak. So ask yourself the question, what compels this character to speak? Why does this character have to say anything? Because if not, they won't say anything. What do they need to do with that line of dialogue? There's gotta be a reason for them to speak. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about subtext. Definition, an underlying intention, meaning, idea, or theme. This is often what is really meant by the line. Uh, and subtext will reflect the three character profiles we discussed earlier, the psychological, physiological, and sociological aspects. Okay, subtext will reflect all of that. So crafting good dialogue will mean that you have to have an awareness of subtext. When actors approach writing, or, or not writing dialogue, saying dialogue in a play, in, in a play or a uh, screenplay, they will look to see what the subtext of the line is, if there is one. Because that's going to usually convey what the actual intention is, what's the underlying tension. So it's really, really important to make sure that you understand what that is as a writer. OK, so let's take an example. Like If you take the line, shut up, you can express that so many different ways. And my tone is going to reflect whatever the subtext is of however I'm going to say that. Right? So something that simple can reflect so many different various intentions. All right, so same thing with the verbs. What I also like to do, when I, again, when I'm revising, not during a first draft, I like to determine a transitive action verb that expresses the character's internal struggle as well. Okay, so we've got that external goal, which might be to attack with this line of dialogue. Uh, but what we can do then is take a look at, is there anything else that's going on here? And this sort of operates as a checklist for me. Because A, I get to say, okay, yes, this line of dialogue has a lot of intention. There's a lot going on with this line of dialogue, and it's conveying what I want this character to say and do at this moment. Uh, but it also ensures that I'm making the most out of the words on the page. Because when you're writing a stage play or a screenplay, especially in those specific um, uh, uh, media, economy of language is extremely important. You don't have a lot of space or time to have long, lengthy explorations of character. You have to do it pretty quickly. So every single line of dialogue has to has to convey as much meaning as possible. In a novel, especially if you're writing you know, with something with a, that requires a very large page count, you have a little bit more leeway. Right? So you can have blocks and blocks of prose description to describe the character. In a screenplay and a stage play, you don't really have that. Okay? I like to take the same principle in terms of approach, the approach to dialogue that I use when I'm writing stage plays and screenplays, and I like to use that when I'm writing prose dialogue as well. It's, it, for me, it's the, kind of the same thing. 
All right, so this is something that's fun. I don't do this all the time um, because it doesn't work for every line, but it is something that's kind of fun to think about when I'm going through and I'm, when I'm rereading my book or my stage play or my screenplay. And that's the hashtag technique. And this is something that kind of came from social media. So if you take the line, the sample line, shut up and apply a subtext phrase using a hashtag, in social media now, if you're on social media, the hashtag, while it was originally created to itemize things, you could search by hashtag and look at conversations under that hashtag. Now it's kind of evolved into a, this is the subtext of what I really mean what I'm saying here. Okay? So what you can do is, and it's fun to do, take a line in your script or your novel and apply a subtext phrase using a hashtag. Okay? Again, I don't do it all the time. I don't do it for every single line like I do with the action verbs. But it is something that helps me to determine, you know, especially if it's a joke line, is there, is there intention under the joke? Is there something that, um, is there more meaning here that I can work with? Let's talk about on the nose dialogue. So on the nose dialogue is defined as dialogue that expresses, expresses exactly what the character means with no subtext. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, in the, in the, the stage play and screen, screenplay world, that, that can tend to be a bad thing, but I don't necessarily think that it is. And the reason why I think that's the case is because a character must be compelled to speak in an on-the-nose manner. Okay, if all of your lines of dialogue are on the nose, and the characters are saying exactly what they think and exactly what they mean at all times, then you have kind of some lousy dialogue there. But if you have like one or two on the nose lines of dialogue every now and then, that's not a bad thing. So uh, keeping on with this on the nose uh, example, if a character says the line, I know you raped my sister, chances are they mean exactly that. I know you raped my sister. Right? That is exactly what I mean. There is no subtext. It's about as direct as it can possibly be. But, uh, there's a typo there. Um, but they've been pushed to say exactly that, and that's key. So those on the nose lines of dialogue, like I said, are not bad, but they have to be earned. Okay? So they should be used sparingly. And usually it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the conversation will have built up to that. Mm -hmm. And then the character will just you know, come out with it. But in order to earn something like that, then we're going to talk around the subject. Right. Right? And that's another good way to think of subtext and a way to, to think about good dialogue is we're not going to actually say what's going on here, but we're going to dance around the topic. Has anyone read the short story, Hills Like White Elephants? By, um, by um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say William Faulkner. I'm like, that's not it. Uh, yes, Ernest Hemingway. Um, uh, that story is about, anyone? Abortion. Abortion. But do they ever mention it in the story? It's not mentioned at all. You have to really, really read between the lines. And actually, the first time I read it was in high school, and I didn't get that at all. Someone had to point it out and say, no, look, this is kind of where they, they, it's hinted at. Right, so that's, another, that's a great example of, and that's actually why that story has been taught you know, as many times as it has, is that it's subtle and it's not directly stated. So that's a, if you have not read that short story, kind of write that down because that's something you want to look at. Hills Like White Elephants. Hills Like White Elephants by Ernest Hemingway. Oh, is there? I will have to check that out. Cool, thank you. I'll have to check that out. Oh, you're probably right about that. I'll check that out. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, and if you're writing a novel, the opening line of a novel is probably your most important, um, you know, because one of the things I've, I've done, even when I was um, working on kind of my last novel, um, I went to Barnes & Noble and I just literally went on the shelf, took out, took out a book, opened it up, looked at the first sentence, 
put it back. Open up another book, looked at the first sentence, put it back. And you're looking to hook the reader with that first line, whatever that happens to be. Right? So, I mean, you can think about that, and it can be a line of dialogue. There's no rule, like some people say you shouldn't start a novel with a line of dialogue. I think that's completely false. Um, I think that might actually be a really cool way to start off. If you're gonna start with that, then you're starting really like in your face, right? Um, but the point, the bottom line is that it's something that needs to be earned. So if you're gonna start big like that, you're gonna still have to have a, a level of, a, of an arc to the scene, whatever that happens to be. Like it needs to progress to something, the dialogue still needs to ramp up to something. When you are, if you have two characters in, in, a, in dialogue, right, that are in a, in a scene, whether it's a novel, whether it's a stage play, whether it's a screenplay. The verbs that you choose for each of those characters need to be in opposition to each other. Okay, that's how you're building the tension. So if one character's verb is attack, the other character's needs to be either counter attack or be defensive, right? There are verbs that tend to be like parry or block or you know, deflect. Those would be the verbs for that other character. And then when they choose to go on the, on the offensive, this other character you know, either they're going to go on the defensive or they're going to try to ramp up the offense even more. So you continue to move in terms of conflict. But that's really key with those verbs. So you're not just arbitrarily attaching verbs that you think work. They have to be verbs that are in opposition to either the circumstances or the other character in the scene. Okay, because that's conflict. If you don't have a scene with conflict, it doesn't need to be there. Um, in a screenplay and in a stage play, very rarely, and I always, I always advise against this, and same thing with a novel too, so if you have lines of dialogue like this in a novel, you might really want to rethink them. Lines of dialogue like, how are you doing today? Hi, how are you? Oh, it's really nice outside today, it's really, I, unless there's something under that, like we're trying to avoid, you know, like it's Thanksgiving dinner and trying to avoid politics, then we might be talking about the turkey. But there's something under that, which is that nobody wants to address the elephant in the room, right? Um, so, you know, but if, if it's just simple like, hey, how are you doing, those kinds of things, those, those lines of dialogue don't have any dramatic heft and there's no verb that I can attach in terms of intention that would be in opposition to another because they're just pleasantry conversations. You want to avoid those as much as possible because if we're talking about economy of language and economy of time in a dramatic form, then you don't have the space for that. Okay, so I don't have the space for someone on the street to ask for directions and then to you know, have the clear directions about how to do it. Even if it's like really cool that you're describing a place and you think you're getting out some detail about the setting, yeah, there really isn't a lot there. I mean, it's not an excuse to be able to you know, provide detail about the setting. Okay, so we, a word on speech patterns. The more you can understa understand that dirty little word grammar, the more you can analyze speech patterns. One of the best things I ever did in grad school was to take a grammar class. Um, and the reason why I say is I took it in grad school is because I actually did not have a grammar class until I voluntarily took it in grad school. Um, yeah, so what that did was it allowed me to recognize different sentence patterns, different speech patterns, the rules of punctuation, understanding all of those rules of punctuation and all of those elements of grammar so I could break them when I needed to do that, okay? It's not that I write perfectly or speak perfectly all the time because I don't, but I understand what the rule is and I will have a character manipulate that rule and play with that rule um, as much as possible. Another thing that works really well for me uh, and it's really something I, 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 a lot of people have said this in terms of, um, of dialogue, is to give a character a specific idiom. And that is a specific way of saying things. So for example, once I wrote a, a short stage play where I had a character who spoke in lists all the time. So he would say, you know, A, blah, 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 and B, blah, 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 and C, blah, 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 blah. And that's just how he spoke. He always just itemized, broke down what he was saying in A, B, and C. And that was a little quirk. And then the other character in the play, when he was being sarcastic, could spit it back at him and make fun of him for speaking that way. Right? We, we've seen this at work in, in certain films where a character has a little thing that they say and then the, you know, the other character will spit it back. In the play, um, Hedda Gabler by Enrique Ibsen, 
Um, the, the character of Tessman says the, the, the word or the utterance, hmm, all the time. Just hmm, hmm, hmm. It's actually really annoying. When, if you've seen the play live, you know, it's actually really annoying. But there's a great moment at the, pl at the end of the play when Hedda, his wife, the title character, throws it back at him. And it's the, probably the only line in the play that actually gets a laugh because it's a really heavy play. But it works really, really well because here we, the audience, have been so kind of obsessed with the hmm and like, God, that's really annoying. And then she throws it back and she kind of in that, in that one moment says everything that we're thinking in that moment, which is like, yes, thank God someone recognized that's really annoying. Right, so if you give a character a specific idiom, um, it, it, can, it can be something that really helps. Um, does anyone have an example of that? And to think of a character in a film or think of a character in a play or a novel? Yes. Yes, and they play with that. They play with that all the time. They have this very specific, like Chandler's kind of way of saying things, his speech pattern is something that they actually make fun of and becomes a topic of conversation. Right, absolutely. Anyone else? Yeah, so give a character a specific idiom. Another thing that's really important here, if you are writing a high school or young adult novel or play that deals with young people, chances are you're going to be including slang. Okay? So here's a little rule of thumb with that. If you include today's slang, it's going to immediately feel dated when that slang is no longer popular. Okay. So if you want your novel to kind of have staying power and not have it be considered a period piece later, you need to create your own slang. The movie Clueless did this really well. Um, actually, Amy, Amy Heckerling's other movie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, kind of did the same thing, um, which is they created a vocabulary for their school, so much so that when the movie Clueless came out in the mid-90s, a lot of those lines of dialogue ended up kind of entering into the lexicon, right? Like kind of, they kind of started to become the slang of the time period, but they, they were lines that were made up for the film specifically so that those characters, you know, could talk to each other in a really specific, unique way, and it still feels like slang. But if you were to use slang of a specific period, you know, 20 years from now, it's going to feel a little bit dated. I mean, it may feel dated anyway, but, you know, it's a way to avoid it. Yes. What's your opinion of uh, Catcher in the Rye? Is that of its time, or is that specific to the character of Homer Caulfield? I think it's a little of both in that case. Okay. Yeah, it's been a while since I read it, but I think it's like 15 years since I read it. But he's got a re very repetitive style. Yeah, I think that's a little reflective of who Holden is because he's so conflicted. But, um, but yeah, a, and a little bit of the time period, I guess. Um, now, obviously, if you're writing a, a, a book that dealing with young people or people who would use slang of a specific time period, then you're going to want to do a little bit of research and see, well, what was the slang of that time period? What, what are some of the things that they would have said? And you don't, want to, you don't want the slang to call attention to itself either. You know, there's a not, make a, a nod to subtlety because if then it just becomes kind of a, a parody of it as opposed to um, kind of living in the truth of the moment kind of thing. All right, so... Another thing, study the speech patterns of a geographical region. Dialect matters. Okay, so if you're going back to your character profiles about who this person is, the language of a specific region will, should be reflected in how you choose to articulate that. So my novel that's out um, right now um, has Scottish characters. And so even, and it's told from their points of view. So even in the prose description, not even just the dialogue, the turns of phrase that I use are very specifically Scottish and British. Okay, the, the, the lines of dialogue, yes, absolutely, but even in um, just talking about little things. So for example, um, in kind of the British way of speaking, they don't say so-and-so is in the hospital. They say so-and-so is in hospital. They don't say the the. Okay, it's just a little really light, slight thing. So it's a specific speech pattern that should be kind of embedded in the way that they speak. So if you've got a British character and they don't speak that way, it doesn't resonate as true. Okay? Even in the United States, there are various regionalisms, right? So if you're from Boston and you're drinking from the water fountain, you might call it the water fountain, but you also might call it the bubbler. Right? If you go to the ice cream store in Boston, I said it's kind of marrying a Bostonite, 
Um, if you go to the grocery to the ice cream parlor and, and and you order those little brown things, they're Jimmies. Down here they're sprinkles, but they're Jimmies, right? A, a note about accents, real quick. Um, when I first wrote my novel, the Scottish characters spoke in the Scottish dialect in the first submission draft, and that's not good. I learned. <laughs> I learned that that was not good, um, so I had to eliminate that. Um, and at the at the time, I, I remember feeling like I, when I got that note from agents, it was like, "But they don't understand what I was trying to do," and that kind of thing. And then I reread the novel Dracula ha around the same time. And if you've read Dracula, it's written in the dialect, and it's really hard to read. Like some parts of it are just really really tricky to get through, even if you're like taking your time with it. So it's it's more because of the the reader's attention span, I think. <laughs> it's probably a good reason not to do that. That's why I think, don't think in terms of writing an accent, think of ter in terms of writing in dialect. 